Good afternoon, everyone. This morning, the Security Council met on enhancing African capacities in the areas of peace and security. The Secretary General said that he firmly believes the international community needs to change the narrative about Africa and to establish a higher platform of cooperation that recognizes Africa's enormous potential and promise. In the area of peace and security, he said the African Union and the UN have a shared interest in strengthening mechanisms to defuse conflicts before they escalate and to manage them effectively when they occur. The Secretary General added that enhancing African capacities is essential both in the context of our collective response to international peace and security challenges, as well as for the self-reliance of the African continent. Along with the African Union, he noted that our shared objective is to work closely on the basis of the principles of mutual respect and comparative advantage in all stages of the conflict cycle and in a systematic, predictable, and strategic manner. His full remarks are online. The UN Refugee Agency said today that it is deeply shocked and saddened at reports of the deaths and injuries of internally displaced people in an aerial attack on the embattled Mauza district of Yemen's Daesh governorate. The number of civilian casualties is still being verified, but initial reports indicate that at least 20 people, including women and children, were killed. UNHCR says that this latest incident once again demonstrates the extreme dangers civilians face in Yemen, especially those people attempting to flee violence since they disproportionately bear the brunt of the conflict. The office says it also illustrates the difficulties in providing humanitarian protection and assistance in Yemen. Despite the security and safety conditions, UNHCR's assistance for the internally displaced has reached the Mauza area. You can read more on UNHCR's website. The Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator Stephen O'Brien arrived in Kinshasa for a three-day mission to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Tomorrow, he will fly to the eastern part of the country to inquire about the humanitarian situation in North Kivu, South Kivu, and Tanganyika provinces before visiting the Kasai region. According to the World Food Program, the underreported crisis in the remote Kasai region is the most alarming in the country. WFP is extremely concerned by the lack of resources for this crisis. Despite this, it is launching operations to respond to the urgent food and security needs, and, and nutrition security needs. Our colleagues from the International Organization for Migration have helped 316 Somali migrants return to Somalia over the past four days. Many of these migrants were rescued from a boat near Yemen in February and have been waiting since then to return to their country. While the migrants were waiting to leave, IOM helped ensure that they received medical care, food and clothing, and that the most vulnerable women, children, and medical cases received temporary shelter. The agency also ensured that they travel safely through Yemen and across the Arabian Sea. We've been asked about recent developments on the Korean Peninsula, and what I can tell you is that the Secretary General welcol welcomes the proposal by the Republic of Korea to reopen inter-Korean communication channels and encourages the leadership of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to respond positively. As the Secretary General emphasized on the 20th of April at the Ministerial Level Security Council meeting, the absence of communication channels with the DPRK could be dangerous. Reopening and strengthening commu communication channels, particularly military to military ones, are needed to lower the risk of miscalculation or misunderstanding and reduce tensions in the region. And in a short while, I will be joined by Feketamula Katoa Utakamanu, Undersecretary General and High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States, and Masood bin Momen, Permanent Representative of Bangladesh and Chair of the Least Developed Countries Group. They will be here to brief you on the launch of the uh, office's flagship report entitled Financing the Sustainable Development Goals and the Istanbul Program of Action in the Least Developed Countries. And that will be after I'm done. Before that, are there any questions for me? Yes, Mr. Abadli. Thank you, Farhan. On enhancing uh, security and peace in the continent of Africa, uh, how does the Secretary General concretely uh, propose to uh, strengthen cooperation between the United Nations and the AU? Uh, there, there are some proposals about the strengthening capacity in his full speech. Uh, we, we have that in our counter, and it's available online if you want, but, uh, but have a look at that. Yes. I wanted to ask you about this, the, the, the Saudi-led coalition, the blocking of the plane with the journalists on it. There was a particularly, a, there's a quote um, 
uh, in one of the stories quoting uh, the, a coalition source saying that, quote, the UN must ensure, that the journal ensure the journalist's safety and make sure they do not carry out any other activity. What's, what is the UN's role? Does one, first, does the UN believe that there should be increased international coverage of situations like that in Yemen? What does it do to bring that about? What is it trying to do to get journalists into Sana'a? And what does it think of this position that it's the UN's job to make sure what journalists do once they arrive? Well, we, we do try to get access for journalists whenever we can do so, in, in, including into Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not specifically the duty of our humanitarian flights uh, to carry journalists, but there have been times when we've been willing to do that in order to increase access uh, to this area. Uh, regarding this specific situation, uh, our humanitarian colleagues have informed us that the UN humanitarian air service flight, which was canceled by the coalition yesterday, uh, due to three BBC journalists carrying government visas being on board, was rescheduled for today. The flight took off from Djibouti and landed in Sana'a with 26 humanitarian workers on board, but not the three BBC journalists. As our colleagues have said, this partially explains why Yemen, which is one of the world's largest humanitarian crises, is not getting enough attention in international media. The lack of coverage is hindering humanitarian workers' effort to draw the attention of, of the international community and donors to the man-made uh, catastrophe that the country is experiencing. Okay, I guess, either relatedly or not, can you give a status of what the, the, the Children in Armed Conflict report that normally may come out by this time When's it going to come uh, no, out? No, it, and it, it, it's it's being worked on. Uh, it's it's being worked on. It I, I believe it is expected uh, to go uh, to the member states uh, sometime in probably in early September. We'll give you advance notice before that happens. Uh, yes, uh, Sherwin, and then Joe. Thanks, Thanks Baran. I, I'm sure you've seen that the uh, appeals court in The Hague has ruled uh, that the, uh, the lower court review, the continued detention of President Laurent Gbagbo's trial continues over there. But uh, recently, uh, a former mediator, a mediator to the, the conflict, uh, a former President Thabo Mbeki of South Africa, made some co controversial comments, to say the least, in South Africa, that Gbagbo is uh, uh, central to, to the national reconciliation process in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, and that if he were to be convicted of, of, of the charges he faces in The Hague, that there will be civil war in Cote d'Ivoire. Now, given that the UN has had a peacekeeping mission there for many years, that you've just recently withdrawn, what's the UN's assessment about, about what this former mediator is saying about the role of Bagbo who's facing trial? And I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a broader conversation about this notion of justice versus peace. Well, ideally, the United Nations hopes that countries can achieve both peace and justice as they try to move beyond uh, this, uh, the problems of uh, war and conflict. Uh, with regard to Cote d'Ivoire, as you know, there was a UN peacekeeping mission there which wrapped up its work uh, in the belief that the society was on its way uh, to repairing relations among the various groups. Uh, we think that, uh, that reconciliation has been moving ahead and we hope that it will continue to do so uh, regardless of developments uh, on the ICC front. Uh, regarding that, of course, we, uh, as you know, respect the judicial independence of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and, and we don't second-guess their rulings, which are based on what they feel is needed uh, for uh, the strengthening of, of justice in Cote d'Ivoire, which uh, we hope will go hand-in-hand hand with the reconciliation efforts. Is there, is there any view on the role of Bagbo in, in the future reconciliation in, in Cote d'Ivoire? Obviously, we want all of the leaders uh, of Cote d'Ivoire and the former leaders of Cote d'Ivoire, wherever they may be, to play a helpful role. Uh, and, and that, of course, uh, is not contingent on where they are located. Yes, Joe. Yes, uh, as you know, the ESCWA agency's uh, so-called Israel Apartheid Report uh, was removed last March from the website uh, as per the direction of the UN Secretary General. Uh, but the uh, NGO UN Watch is reporting that uh, that agency's official website and social media posts are uh, replete with uh, references uh, to, quote, apartheid accusations against Israel. Gives a whole number of examples. So I'm wondering, number one, uh, you know, whether anyone in the Secretariat uh, um, is responsible for monitoring as a follow-up to the Secretary General's direction uh, and, and whether, in fact, uh, 
uh, if this uh, charge by UN Watch is true, that uh, the corrective action will be taken to further implement the Secretary General's direction to remove references to apartheid on an official UN uh, website in relation to Israel. Thank you. Well, well just uh, to uh, remind you that that report that, that uh, uh, was issued er er earlier this uh, year was not a report of the Economic and Social Commission on West Asia, but uh, but uh, was by independent experts, and and we don't uh, have any relationship uh, to them uh, regarding the group itself, Esqua. Uh, as you know, it is now under a new leadership, and we would trust that the new leadership of the Economic and Social Commission will uh, be in charge of monitoring the, their communications to make sure that those are in line with UN policies. Well, uh follow up to that. Uh, first of all, I believe that report, as I recall, uh, was issued uh, under, at least allegedly under the auspices of the UN, which is what apparently upset the Secretary General that it, w it wasn't run through his uh, normal offices of review, uh, and therefore he directed it that it be removed from the, uh, from the website bearing the name of the United Nations. Well, the same problem uh, apparently is being perpetrated by that agency and a UN official website using the term apartheid uh, against Israel, um, just in a different form. And shouldn't there be some monitoring at the Secretariat to make sure that the overall direction of the Secretary General in relation to that charge of, quote, apartheid, uh, that his direction is followed? Well, we do trust, uh, like I said, there is new leadership in the Economic and Social Commission of, uh, for West Asia. And we do trust that they will do the monitoring and any appropriate follow-up that's necessary. Uh, as, regarding that report, of, it, it did not follow the consultation process that the Secretary General would have expected. Mustafa. Farhan, uh, just yesterday you reaffirmed the freedom of worship, but uh, the same day uh, Israeli police uh, shot and injured uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque Imam. Do you have any reaction for this? Uh, we're, we're concerned about any uh, steps taken uh, in the old city of Jerusalem and the holy sites that impede uh, the freedom of worship by any of the, the groups or religions, and we hope that the status quo will be maintained in that area. Yes, uh, Majid. Uh, thank oh, you, I have, uh, Farhan. I have two questions about Syria and one about Iraq. I want to start with Syria. Um, Turkey and uh, U.S.-backed Kurdish forces are on the brink of a war in, in Syria, and the U.S. forces are right in the middle of them. Um, do you have any comments about these serious military developments in Syria? We, we certainly hope that all of the parties uh, dealing with the fight against Daesh in Syria will uh, coordinate their activities with each other and that there's no misunderstandings or problems uh, between them. And about the political track, it's just a question of... of uh, in Syria, France is now uh, proposing a contact group and uh, proposing that all major powers who are involved in the war in Syria to propose a solution. To uh, And this seems to be a proposal for another process other than Astana, and now we have Geneva. Uh, does the Secretary General feel that the UN-led process is being sidelined with all these other efforts in the, in the, in the regional and international level? No, no. Our hope is that all of the various uh, efforts by uh, different concerned countries will involve working together to w to strengthening the process, including uh, the process that his own special envoy, Stefan de Mistura, has been sharing uh, in the talks in Geneva. As you know, the Stana talks have helped uh, to contribute uh, to the Geneva process, and uh, Mr. de Mistura has been very appreciative of the contributions made uh, by the parties who have attended the Stana talks, and we are hopeful that any further processes will will follow that uh, approach. And to my uh, no, Iraq. no, no. There's there's other people asking. I can come back to you. Yes. Um, this is Jehan um, from Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, if you can just talk a bit more about the um, the Yemen and uh, the the flight that was carrying aid t to Yemen. Uh, if you can specifically talk about th the fact that a plane carrying aid um, was stopped. In addition to the fact that there were journalists on board, well, I mean, well, uh, I, as I mentioned just now, there, there was uh, the plane that had been carrying humanitarian workers and aid, as well as journalists, and it, it was stopped. So it, it was our concern. Now, as of today, uh, the humanitarian workers and and the aid have traveled in, but not, um, but not unfortunately, the um, the three journalists uh, from BBC. 
uh, we, we do want not just to be able to, to bring in aid, which is, of course, a crucial aspect of the work we do, but we also want the world to know what's going on. And so steps like this do not help uh, because, uh, again, this has been a large man-made humanitarian problem. The world needs to know and uh, journalists need to have access. Yes. I ask you about the, about the um, Central African Republic. <clears throat> There's a long AP story about, and talks about in Bangasu, and it puts a, a pretty high number on the, on, on the number of people they say killed uh, in fighting between the UN peacekeepers and militias there. And they also quote individual residents who say, you know, that, that the, who blame the, the UN's aggressive approach for some of the things that, that have happened to them. So I wanted to know. One, does the UN, one, one is quoted as saying that the UN soldiers shot her in the hand and she's clearly a civilian. How does the UN keep track of, of, of the people killed in the, in, when, when it's engaged in these firefights? Does it acknowledge that it has shot some civilians? And if so, how many? And then what does it do in those cases? Well, the UN tries to take steps to limit any uh, civilian casualties. We certainly are not intentionally firing at civilians. There, there are certain complex war environments where civilians may be caught up in, in the crossfire among different warring parties. But uh, th the standing rules of engagement of UN peacekeeping troops are not, uh, not to shoot in areas of civilian concentration. Sure, but I guess, in, in like for example, this, this article quotes a woman saying, the UN shot me. Is that something that the UN has checked out? And if they do find that it did happen, intentionally or not, what do they then do? If, if we believe that any civilians were harmed in any way by the actions of peacekeepers, we do follow up, but that's something we do across the board. So is there some way to know in Bangasu if, any, if the UN has acknowledged shooting intentionally or not any civilians? I can check about the details of the incident. MINUSCA does follow up uh, whenever there's any particular fr problem in terms of incidents in, in large uh, civilian zones. Yes. Hi, yes, uh, Farhan, I wanted to uh, uh, follow up about the reports of Amnesty International that more than 5,000 civilians have been killed by uh, Iraqi and coalition forces during the battle in Mosul. Um, has the Iraqis responded for your calls to further in investigate? Um, is there any update about that? Well, that's really uh, a question about whether the Iraqis have responded is really a question for the Iraqi authorities. Uh, of course, we're, we're concerned about any we're, we're concerned about any reports of civilian casualties, and we hope that the government uh, will follow up on those. Yes. Farhan, does Secretary General uh, Guterres intend to take a vacation this summer, and would he be able to give a press conference before here? Uh, we expect for him to give you uh, the next substantial press conference. We expect to be prior to the start of the General Assembly, and we'll try to give you the dates on that. And yes, uh, sometime in August, uh, we expect him to take uh, a little bit of time off, uh, and we'll try and get give you... Uh, Details of that as, as that happens. Yes, Richard. Uh, pardon me if this was announced, but do you know is September 18th, the day before the start of the General Assembly, has that been designated as a special one-day event like we've had, unfortunately, in other years? Uh, I, I don't have any details on that for now, but let, let me see whether I can get something on that on September 18th. Uh, yes, yes, please. Uh, forgive me if you were just earlier, Farhan. Um, any statements about the crisis in Gaza over the electricity? Any further um, statements from the Secretary General? Uh, there haven't been any uh, statements in the last couple of days, but you know what our uh, concerns have been, uh, both from the Secretary General's perspective and from those of officials on the ground, uh, like Nikolai Mladenov and his humanitarian coordinator, Robert Piper. We've been very concerned uh, that, that uh, the civilian population of Gaza is suffering because of uh, the lack of electricity and uh, the severe uh, hu uh, humanitarian and economic consequences of that. And so we're hopeful that uh, the authorities on the ground, including the Palestinian Authority and uh, the Israeli government, will, uh, will help work on, on uh, uh, alleviating the situation there. And, and just as a quick follow, what, uh, if anything, is the UN going to do help, to help this crisis end? Well, to, to the extent that we've been able to, to provide uh, some support uh, to the, the authorities in Gaza so that, that there can be uh, less of an impact. We've been doing that, uh, in, including, uh, in, including uh, through uh, 
uh, trying to help with uh, the, the basic facilities. But ultimately what's needed is, is uh, Gaza, uh, for Gaza to have uh, a, a regular supply of fuel. Uh, regarding our humanitarian efforts on the ground, uh, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and its partners, including the Relief and Works Agency and UNICEF, uh, have been uh, working together on the purchase, distribution, and delivery of 810,000 liters uh, of emergency fuel uh, uh, earlier, uh, earlier this month uh, to be delivered uh, through, uh, through this month uh, to 189 prioritized health and water centers. And also at the start of the month, OCHA launched an appeal for $25 million uh, to address urgent needs in Gaza. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to go back to my earlier question and try to ask in a different way. Uh, we talked in terms of process, who's responsible for monitoring that website. But let me get to the substance, if you can uh, answer specifically what you believe the Secretary General's view comment would, or comment would be on the use of the term apartheid in relation to Israel on any official UN website? I think the Secretary General himself made his own uh, views very clear on this in February when he denounced uh, the, the report that had been put out without his oversight. Yes. I wanted to ask you, yesterday at the, at the, at the stakeout and after, um, uh, Espen Barthida, the, the when actually employed special advisor on Cyprus, indicated that, that he doesn't think that, that going, at least for the, for the time being, He'll be working on the file until the sides decide to go forward. But he also seemed to indicate he would have no problem, no, you know, uh, if it were publicly known when he's actually employed, i.e., when he's, you know, the hours that he puts in for any particular period of time, and seemed to indicate that that might also actually show the parties whether the process was going well or not going well. So I wanted to know first, uh, one, are you aware, is there any place for the other when actually employed special advisors and envoys where it's possible to know how many hours they work, not as a matter of, of, of being a cheapskate, but to know, as he said, how much they're actually working on the file. Uh, Where, where's that information available? And, should no, it, and will you make it available? No, no the, 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 that information is shared with the UN as part of the process by which, in fact, they get paid. And then, as a result of that, uh, the, the details about their payment are then shared with, uh, with member states as needed. What, in, what, in what document? I mean, are there uh, secret uh, budget uh, documents that the no, public can't see? No, no. Uh, th okay. These are things that are shared with, with member states in terms of when, when they uh, ask about the costs of different operations and different missions. Why isn't it put in, for example, the reports, the financial reports on, on the missions? I, mean, I guess I'm just saying because he's a particular envoy. He has no problem with it being public and said it might even be the, a the benefit to make the, it public. The reports of the political missions, no, sure. yes, yes those, those would be included in those for the member states. But I guess, my, just as a general matter, isn't it public spending? Is it, is, it, is it unreasonable to say that the public has a right to know all, how much they're getting paid? All of the spending that the UN does is shared with the member states, which ultimately means that it, it is available. So can to, you, as, in what document public? is the payment to a when actually employed envoy made available to the member states, but apparently not the no, public. I mean, the, these, are, these are not employee by employee. They're, they're done by offices. The cost of the offices are given to the, mem to the member states. Right. And the member states approve those costs. Do you see any benefit of, of knowing when, as he said, of, of knowing when a when actually employed special advisor is actually working and if, if some files are in fact dormant and dead? The figures, like I said, are tallied basically by offices. It's not by individual. We don't, we don't give each individual's payment to the sure. member states. We give the payments for, uh, that are given to offices. That's how we handle it. Okay. Can I, ask you, I want to ask you something else uh, about reform. Okay, about one more tree. and then Mr. Abadi and then we go to the guest. Yes. Okay, I had something else, but I wanted to, because it's coming up, uh, this retreat that the Secretary General is, has, is planning for July 22nd. Could you, will you confirm it, that it's, it's at Green Tree? And number two, Who's going? Are all member states invited, or are, are groups invited? And second, and, and finally, some 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 member states have said there was a meeting with something called the Group of Friends of the Future of the United Nations. Or is, did that meeting take place? Because I look at his schedule and I never saw it. Was it was such a meeting held, and was it about reform? This meeting on the twenty second is part of the effort to discuss the reforms of the United Nations. It is, in fact, with all member states, uh, and it's not at a location that I disclosed, but it's in the New York area. Yes. Thank you. To that point, I understand that besides economic reforms that the Secretary General has already announced, he's working on political reforms. Is that correct? And would, when would they be announced? Uh, he'll inf uh, 
inform you of all of his re reform processes in due course. They're, they're going step by step. As you know, he an mentioned and, and announced in public his development reforms last week. There'll be further details. Some of these things will be discussed in, uh, in different formats. For example, he's doing uh, a town hall with staff tomorrow uh, in addition to the, the Saturday retreat. And so there, there's more of an effort to discuss with the various different stakeholders the reforms he's undertaking, and he'll also discuss them in, in the public sphere.